Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be back. I really appreciate the warm welcome, and I really appreciate the Health Trust and what people here are doing. When Fred called and asked me if I would be willing to come back kind of five years from the last time I was here, I said in a heartbeat. And I sat and tried to remember all of the activities that I visited when I was here the first time, including the food bank and some of the frontline service delivery that was going on. But the thing that stuck in my heart the most is what I brought back with me in this little box, which is this beautiful compass that I received as a gift for appearing here the last time, which has my name engraved on it. But it was a reminder from Fred where this organization lived so that I would always be able to find my way back here. And so I did. So I uh, really have a fond recollection not only of the enjoyable experience that I had, but of the incredible value and importance that the Health Trust and the whole community of people represented here provide to this particular community. I don't think, despite the fact that when I was here last, I had been the director of the CDC and had lived in the Bay Area for a long time, I don't think I actually really recognized the extent of the health disparities across our entire peninsula until that visit. And that really is foundationally why I wanted to come back and be supportive and really acknowledge and recognize that while a lot of progress has been made, there's still a tremendous amount of work to be done. So what I'd like to talk about a little bit today is just the big picture of health creation and what it really means to create a community that has all of the resources that good health can provide. I have to start by revealing my conflicts of interest as well as my interests. I am in the private sector now, so that's an important thing to do. I also sit on the board of several nonprofit organizations, including the Hilleman Trust, which is a wonderful nonprofit organization in India where we try to take vaccines that work well in developed countries but aren't really designed for poor children and repurpose them in a nonprofit way to try to make them more accessible and available. And we're having some great successes there. Um, but you can see I'm uh, still very interested in global health and my passion about health and health creation on a global scale really is part of my, um, my psychology. I, until a couple of weeks ago, was still attending on the Infectious Disease Service at San Francisco General Hospital, which is where my true heart is. I love medicine. I will always be a doctor. And um, it, it's important to remind me that that is, at the core, one of the most foundational kinds of service that anybody in our profession can um, ascribe to. So the theme here is that despite the fact that as a nation and as a community, we spend more money on health than we do on most other things and more money on health than any other country in the world, we're not the healthiest nation. We have pitiful health rankings. These are slightly dated data, but they haven't changed at all in the last couple of years. So we spend the most, but we're not the healthiest. And what exactly is going on and why is that? especially in the wake of our passage of a wonderful new plan to try to improve affordable access to health services. And in the debate leading up to the passage and now the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, we are really trying to simultaneously solve for three things, for quality, for cost, and for access. So these were the stated principles that underpin the development of the legislation, but of course, the debate is primarily about cost. What we've really managed to do is to change who pays and how much and to redistribute the finances of the healthcare system. But I have to always ask myself, and I'm asking you to think about this too, have we actually created more health? In the process of solving for affordable healthcare delivery services, are we going to end up with a community and a nation that's healthier than it was before we implemented these changes? And I'm not sure the answer is yes, for reasons that I'll try to describe. The reason that health care insurance or health care access does not guarantee better health is because health is not created in hospitals. Health is created in homes, in schools, and workplaces. Health is the responsibility of the community government, our cities, our counties. Health is the responsibility of parents and people and teachers. Health is 
where we go to think about our ability to thrive and survive and be vital contributors in our society. It's not just about what we do when we're sick or we need a disease care. And foundationally, we're not really getting health value out of all the dollars we're spending on disease care because they're the most expensive dollars and we're not investing properly in the things up front that are less expensive and more valuable. So if we want more health, we have to kind of agree on how we think about it. The WHO has provided some perspectives on health and the one that I like the best is this bottom one that says that health is not a state of being. Health is a resource. It's a natural resource in the same way that we might think about other natural resources like clean air, or clean water, or, or minerals. Health is a resource that allows us and enables us and empowers us to do many of the other things that make life worth living. And we, we thought about health the way we think about our natural resources. We would realize that we need to invest in it and we need to protect it. And that actually it's a community asset. Communities that have a lot of healthness are going to be better off, more resilient, more able to do things for all of the members of the community and presumably would have fewer health disparities because they would be more empowered and enabled. Communities with low health resource would be disadvantaged. And when we look at the economic status of communities and we look at the amount of healthness in those communities, we can see that there is obviously a direct correlation. So if we thought about health, not as I'm either sick or I'm well, but if we thought about health more broadly as a personal treasure, you know, if I, if I really thought about my health the way I think about my earrings, I would make sure that I took really good care of them, that I nurtured them, I know where they are. I would be thinking the same way about how do I really treasure and protect my health. And we can invest in it and we can grow it over time in the same way that we invest and grow our retirement accounts or other things that we count on to help us in the future. We would also recognize that at the community level, health drives community value. I was so frustrated in Atlanta um, one time when I was part of one of the chamber meetings because the Chamber of Commerce was talking about how to make Atlanta more attractive to business leaders and to, to attract more business into the community. And they put all of the different assets of Atlanta on the map, the educational systems, the transportation, the airport, you know, the development community, and so on and so forth. Never once did they mention that Atlanta had the CDC, the Emory School of Public Health, the Morehouse School of Public Health, the American Cancer Society, the Arthritis Foundation, never really recognizing that healthness was also a resource and that with more healthness in the community, you'd have healthier and more productive workers and that would be an important part of the economic engine. So I think health is a mindset and a treasure and foundationally it's hope. And if you work with people who lack health, I think you really understand this latter point, that the absence of hope is very part and parcel on the same track as the absence of good health. So let's think about kind of the two approaches to this dilemma. On the middle column, I have sort of the descriptors of a healthcare delivery system. On the far right calendar, uh, column, the description of a, of a health system. If we want to fix the problem of affordable access to care, we pass a reform legislation, but that doesn't really transform our society into one that has more health. If the driver is cost, then insurance is the answer. But if the driver is health value, we have to think about other ways to create more health in our environment. And we have to really be focused on health and health equity. We also need to think not just about disease treatment, of course that's important, we need to be thinking about health style and, and health in all places. And really, ultimately, the measure of our success is not just the typical measures of an effective healthcare delivery system, but measures that resonate with citizens, the things that people really care about in life, how they can live, interact with the people they love, and enjoy their time and their experiences as they move through the various life stages. So just to kind of play that out as an experiment, how would we think about health creation at the community level? 
you know, first obvious thing is a very complex network as the health trust is one hub of a very complex network in a community that has all kinds of actors and players and entities interfacing with health and health care. But there is something missing in this picture that we have not yet solved for. And that is the people who are playing in this environment, this ecosystem, are not all aligned around the same goal. Some people want to save money. Some people want better quality disease care. Some people want to make more money. There are lots of different agendas in play. And until communities can really come together and identify a shared goal or a shared vision of what at the big picture we want to accomplish at the community or city or state level, it's just about impossible to figure out how to align all the players. And we haven't done that very successfully yet in most communities. But just as, again, a thought experiment, suppose the goal was to increase our health assets, that what we really wanted at the end of the day was better health. Now, when you look at most health statistics, what you see is, for example, how many people have teenagers? A few people. So if you have a teenager, you can read the statistics. How many teenagers text and drive? How many teenagers have unsafe sex? How many teenagers use drugs? How many teenagers smoke cigarettes? But what you have a hard time finding is how many teenagers are healthy and don't have any of those risks? Because we don't actually measure the proportion of our teenagers, for example, that are moving their health in the right direction. So if we were able to align around a few of those concepts, such as infant thrival, the proportion of infants in the community that were really optimally born, nourished, um, provided with the appropriate resources, immunizations, and so forth, or fit children who were not obese and were physically active and had access to good nutrition, or the proportion of adults in the community with healthy hearts and no cardiovascular risk factors. There are also ways to go beyond this that are largely imaginary right now, of course, but if a community were able to decide on the set of health measures or health states that it wanted to drive for, it's possible to align policies to support that. For example, you could give tax credits to businesses in a community if the health of the community improved, or you could give insurance discounts to citizens or improve reimbursement rates of the care delivery system in that community, or caps malpractice insurance rates, et cetera. At a community level, you could create economic incentives to try to better align the players in the health creation compartment, as well as the healthcare delivery system, to drive toward population health improvement. And there are some experiments like this going on around the country right now, and I think we're all waiting to see how they turn out. But it's important to at least have the conversation about would this be better, is this possible, how can we truly invest in health and health creation and move away from this discombobulated ecosystem that we're operating in right now. Now, of course, one of the major ways in which we're not healthy relates to our behaviors and the kinds of risks that they create for non-communicable diseases. And I'm not going to go into all of these in detail, but I did want to just illustrate the sort of the big picture, um, and I don't mean a pun by that, as you'll see, but the big picture um, that has to be at the core of health creation at any community, and particularly this one, because I've looked at some of the data for this region. That really relates to unhealthy diet and physical inactivity. So I just want to review for you the state of obesity in the United States over time, beginning in 1985, as you'll see, as the color code moves to the right on these slides, you'll see what's happened with obesity over time in the US. So just watch the clock tick, 91, 90, 92, 93, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and so forth. So we have a tremendous problem with obesity that continues to drive our lack of good health in our nation. And that is a major underpinning of why our health costs are so expensive and why we're really lagging behind and being one of the healthiest nations. So what do we do about these kinds of behavioral problems and how they drive uh, bad health? You know, 
it's one thing to think about how you create health at a policy level in a population. It's another thing to figure out how you translate that into individual behaviors. Very difficult to do. Now, one theory about how this is done is to educate people. So if we could just educate people, give them more brochures, more pamphlets, more webinars, more radio spots, just more billboards, if we could just get more education into people, they would do the right thing. Now, I beg to differ, but I don't think that education alone results in doing the right thing. And there are a lot of reasons for it. If, if education alone was enough, I don't think anyone would smoke cigarettes because there's hardly a person on earth who doesn't know that tobacco is harmful to your health. That obviously is not the only piece of the pie. And let's just talk about people and how they make decisions. Let's talk about this little boy um, you know, who's setting himself up for a lifetime of health challenges, including hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer, because he's getting an unhealthy start in life. He lives in a toxic environment, constantly exposed to tempting and tantalizing advertisements about good and tasty foods that have high sugar, high fat, high calorie carbohydrates. Also, in most communities, he probably walks to school in a place with no sidewalks, so usually don't walk to school because um, there's alternative transportation provided. That picture up there in the upper right-hand corner is a neighborhood in Atlanta, which just really demonstrates the complete, utter absence of sidewalks or any mechanism for people to naturally ambulate and get around safely to school. I love this one where the sidewalk just simply ends, or you're walking through something that's clearly unsafe. Or you have role models. What kind of role model are the children in these neighborhoods experiencing when they're thinking about their own activity level or their physical fitness? Now, this is not an environment where education is going to change the child's ability to eat healthy and make good choices. And I think we need to move beyond the simple theory that just knowing will result in better behavior. So how do we choose our behaviors? Well, it's complicated. And there's not a lot of science yet in the areas of behavioral economics or social decision making that are totally targeted in this field. But there are some perspectives. First, there is a source of good choices that comes from our inside, from our family values, from things we grew up with, and of our own sense of moral compass, and particularly uh, parents who are strongly motivated to try to create a good life for their children. Very powerful source of uh, opportunity to influence choice. We also can succumb to other kinds of external motivations, either good or bad motivations. Some are intrinsic ones, like I just feel so much better if I go to my Pilates class every week, or if I you know, smoke these cigarettes, I'm going to be coughing and feeling absolutely miserable when I wake up the next morning. But we can also create at a societal level various kinds of rewards or sanctions for better behavior. And I think many employers are beginning to do this now through the structure of their incentive plans, their health insurance benefits, and so forth, to really create an economic incentive for people to remain healthy and to engage their families in those kinds of behaviors. Certainly, there's a role for policy, for regulations, and the kinds of things that create positive and negative sanctions. I was. Um, the CDC director for a number of years, and I always uh, go back to San Francisco General to attend on the county wards a few weeks a year. And it wasn't until 2008 that San Francisco General became a smoke-free campus. And I know how hard it was to do it because it was you know, patient resistance, some employee resistance, and some community resistance because they didn't want people running across the street to smoke. But it, finally happened and the joy of being in the hospital and not having to contend with that just it just made my day because finally you know we were able to just create one environment where our patients their families and our staff did not have to breathe secondhand smoke there's another very powerful way of motivating good behavior that gets short shrift 
And that has to do with the whole concept of nudging and creating the context for choice where we don't even know we're making a choice. It just happens automatically. Um, CDC has done a lot of work in this area. And some of the things, um, it, just to illustrate the concept, are these stairwells. You know, most people don't use the stairwell. Most buildings are constructed so that the staircase is hideous. I remember once at the county um, getting into the stairwell and uh, you know, on the top floor of the hospital and not being able to get out of it until I got to the bottom of the hospital and people had been shooting drugs in there, urinating in it, and it was the last place I was ever going to go again. So we took the elevator. But if you have a staircase, you can nudge people into using it. Um, when we built new campus buildings at the CDC, we turned the elevators off except for one. So people had to wait a really long time to get an elevator, and they were hence more motivated to take the stairs. We also, when we were building new buildings, we put the staircase in the beautiful center glass, lovely pavilion, so it was enticing to take the stairs. Um, we also found through some experimentation that if you decorate the stairs and play music in them, people will be a lot more likely to use them. That unfortunately has an extinction coefficient of a few weeks, but if you want people to use the stairs on a much enduring basis, let them put their children's art on the wall. Because people will go into the staircase to see their child's art and to have that kind of social connection with the other children. And it makes the whole workforce seem more connected and more relevant to the family situation. So that's one example of nudge. Many, many other examples. For example, um, many cafeterias, including the House of Representatives in the United States Congress, price food so that you pay less for the healthy foods and you pay a lot more for the expensive foods. You also see the healthy foods first and you don't get to the cinnamon roll or the pizza until after you've gone through the salad bar and the fruits and vegetables. So that's a nudge. Some people may say, well, that's you know anti-libertarianism. It is a kind of paternalistic anti-libertarianism, but it I think is justifiable in the context of the problems we're trying to solve for at a community level. So when we put this all together in terms of how good choices are made or how better choices are made, it is important that people think about what I should do, what I want to do because I'm being rewarded or sanctioned for it, what I have to do because it's the law, what I can do, which is an area where organizations like yours and like the Health Trust do play a role because there is an empowerment and a capability development that has to occur. But ultimately, um, probably the most efficient way of creating good choice is to make it automatic and the default for everyone. Just to illustrate how effective this can be, the policy component, the power of policy over time just think about what's happened with tobacco. And all of these things are known to influence people's choice about smoking or their decision to give up smoking. And there are many things in here, including sanctions, internal, external policies about what you can and cannot do, and ultimately, um, in a sense, nudging people into smoking less because it's expensive and they are not able to um, afford the situation. And of course, the result of all of this over time is that we have been able to demonstrate significant reductions in tobacco utilization, but took a long time and we're not done yet. And there's also always the um, concern for recidivism, particularly in light and some of the controversy around the new devices that have come on the market. There are also recommendations about similar approaches to food policy that can help either nudge or regulate or motivate people to make better choices about their diet and their nutrition. These are recommendations from the World Health Organization. And these are not things that are going to happen from Obamacare. This is not about the health care delivery system. This is about city governments, county governments, citizens, organizations, NGOs, the private sector. This is about people coming together and saying, we need to create more health in our community. We need to really look at the science behind these policies and choose some steps to take at the community level that will really make a difference. And that really kind of then gets to the notion of health in all policies, health in all places, and health for all people. You know, at the community level, when you make a policy to build a new road, 
there's a health opportunity there, because that's a bike lane, or a safe crosswalk, or access to recreation and parks. When you make a policy decision to build a new school, as many communities did with the uh, investment in following the financial meltdown to spend federal dollars to stimulate the economy, many communities put macro investment in infrastructure but hardly any communities thought about how they could put a health policy component into that investment. So they missed the opportunity to really um, not only create an infrastructure solution, but to do it in such a way where it was contributing to health creation at the community level. I just challenge all of us to think more creatively about how we utilize the policy decisions that we're making, think about the health opportunity that they can create and the incremental cost of adding that opportunity, how that would get armatized over the lifespan of the investment and really begin to create some true health value. We can do this in all communities. There are health opportunities in every place. There's health opportunities at home, in schools, in the workplace, at the community level. Um, and clearly, in a community like the Silicon Valley, where the health disparities are so magnified. They've got so many talented people here and so many innovators in this environment. How can we get that talent to focus on this innovation opportunity and really do what needs to be done here to create health for all? It's possible, but the gaps are huge, and we do need to really concentrate on policy movement, inform citizens, and a real commitment to addressing the health disparities that exist. I mean, just this morning we were talking about Sunnyvale, you know, average home price $800,000, and yet some 60% of children or some very high proportion of children require food supplement um, support because they can't get adequate nutrition, children who live in those communities. So what is that about? That's shameful, and we can do better than that. And, and um, just to kind of end with, um, a perspective for people who want to read a little bit more about this. There are three books that I found very helpful in my thinking. One is Nudge, which is kind of the paternalistic libertarianism that I was talking about. A Necessary Revolution, which is a book that is more about um, ecology and yet I think has some important lessons for us in thinking about the difference between fixing the problem of affordable health care delivery and so creating the solution for better health in our communities. And then lastly, how individuals and groups of people um, can solve big problems when they come together in organizations with the support of entities like the Health Trust or the Health Department or many of the other organizing principles that engage together. Indeed, at the end of the day, it's mobilized people like you um, who really can solve these really hard problems. And you know, I hope if I'm invited to come back in five years, I will see even more progress in the community than has been accomplished in the last five years. So thank you very much, and I'll take my compass with me so I know how to get back. Thank you.